So Hannah, I will, I am grateful for you being here tonight and you now have the, have the floor. Go ahead. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody. This is a crazy, awesome crowd for a Sunday evening. I can't believe how many people are here. This is great. Um, and thank you for letting me kind of, uh, uh, join you guys and kind of hijack your meeting for a little bit. Um, but yeah, so thank you, Jen, for uh, the introduction. I'm with Women for a Healthy Environment. We um, are a local nonprofit. We, our office actually is located right in East Liberty, um, but uh, we're kind of, we're all working from home right now. So I am up and upstairs in my room. Um, but yeah, so I'm the Healthy Homes Coordinator and I do most of our community uh, facing programming around how the built environment impacts our health and where those things intersect is really especially exacerbated now that most people have been home for almost a year. And so really kind of highlighting the things in our home that make us healthy and the things in our home that can really um, maybe hinder and impact um, our health outcomes. So I do have some slides. I'll try to make it as fun and not as boring as possible. Um, and so any questions, please feel free to either put them in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, this can be super casual and conversational. Um, and I'm here to probably impart some things that you already know and hopefully shed some light on things that you might not know um, and provide some resources um, that should be really helpful for everybody. So um, I'm gonna share my screen because I do have some slides. Uh, from the beginning. All right, well, um, this is just kind of an overview, so you kind of know what you're getting yourself into, but um, we'll uh, keep it to overview of kind of what uh, we'll talk about and then um, really shed some light on some resources and have any times for some questions. But I went for a healthy environment, like I said, our um, real goals, are, our real uh, mission is around the environment and health. And so to really inform people about how those things interact and how they do impact our health and how you can advocate and create a healthier space, um, both in your home and in your communities. And so um, I'll kind of preface all of this by saying that if proactive and preventative policies existed, a lot of our issues wouldn't be um, what we have to deal with. And so um, while a lot of this will seem like a lot of resources for us individually that we can do in our home, it is really important to recognize that there are a lot of big, bigger systemic things at play here that really do create um, an environment that can sometimes be unhealthy. Um, so that's kind of our, our overview there. And so at Women for Healthy Environment, we do have three main program areas. Like I said, I'm the Healthy Homes Coordinator, but we do have two other arms of uh, the organization that focuses on the school environment um, and uh, healthy school buildings and then also in the early learning environment, which is really a focus on um, like the daycare setting and the early learning um, setting as well. So those programs look a little bit different, but have all the same um, uh, things in mind um, in terms of environmental health and our health. And so what does that look like for us? So in a healthy home, that might look a little bit different than what it looks like in a school or in an early learning center, um, but it really is kind of all the same uh, when, it, when it comes down to it. So um, I didn't come up with these. Uh, the National Center for Healthy Housing and the CDC and the EPA came up with these principles of a healthy home. And I think most of them can probably seem pretty straightforward. So I won't read the list off to you, but um, it's a lot of the things that you would think of. And so that's keeping um, spaces well-maintained. So chipping, cracking, peeling paints, um, stuff like that, as well as, you know, dry and thermally controlled uh, dampness, moisture that can lead to um, some issues that uh, we'll see impact our health, as well as pest free, nobody likes critters in their homes, um, things safely as well. So injury prevention can be a big part of um, a healthy home as well, and contaminant free, we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, uh, later in this conversation and um, when we kind of speak again with Wendy uh, later um, in April and then uh, ventilated as well that kind of falls into all that air quality stuff. And so what does that look like in terms of where environment impacts our health? Well, that's where we think about things specifically like lead exposure um, and lead in our home. Things like mold and mold exposure and how it impacts um, our air quality. Things like radon. Um, and stuff uh, in our indoor air that can kind of impact um, how we breathe. And so the cleaning products we use, the personal care products we use, um, like our shampoo and our soaps, um, and even the way that we deal with those critters that nobody wants um, to have in their home. And so this is kind of where we see this intersection of how we, um, 
how we uh, understand what's in our environment and then how we'll think about how it impacts our health. And so I don't expect anybody to be able to read this because the font is very, very tiny. Um, but basically this is an infographic that we created that kind of helps you think about room by room, what you'd wanna dive a little bit deeper in and what you'd wanna think about in that specific room. And so from left to right, it kind of takes you through um, kind of like a laundry room cleaning area in through if you have any children in a nursery and you're thinking about buying furniture, thinking about our outdoor air environment and polluters, um, all the way in through like a bathroom as well um, into a kitchen. And so we'll kind of touch on all of these things throughout. It was just kind of a, um, an infographic that we like to have to kind of put this all into perspective room by room. Um, these are the things we want to think about. And um, all of the uh, infographics that I'll share today are available in a PDF form on our website too. So I'll make sure I share the link to our website in um, the chat here. So this was kind of just an overview of what we'll be talking about. And I did want to preface that we are talking about healthy homes. And um, I don't know if a lot, if we have any renters or tenants here, but I did want to make sure that I do highlight that under uh, the PA state law, under the warranty of habitability, um, you are uh, entitled to live in a safe and habitable home. Um, and even if you wrote in your lease, I promise to live with all the bugs in the world, you can never waive that right. You always have the right to habitability. So if you are a tenant, these exist. Um, these There's steps and there's ways to go about exerting this right. And under that can, um, can fall a few things. It has to... Um, and there it has to be like a serious defect. And so that has to mean that it will harm, a, harm health in some way um, or provide some kind of um, uh, risk for injury. And so things like that include a leaking roof, uh, broken floors, lack of water, things like that. But also we can talk about uh, maintenance and habitability in the terms of uh, cracking and chipping paint. Um, if you're exposed to carbon monoxide, if you don't have a carbon monoxide um, uh, uh, detector and things like that, that could fall under that. And so I did want to preface that, um, that for any of the renters out there, if you're, if we're going through this conversation and you're like, oh, I see that in my apartment right now, but I can't do anything about that. Please make sure you follow up with me. And we'll make sure that we get you connected to someone who can help you have those conversations with a landlord. Um, okay, so I did want to kind of lay out, we'll talk about all those things. Um, throughout the uh, throughout the topic today, but we'll start with lead. Um, that's something at Women for Healthy Environment that we've been doing a lot of work on in the, um, you know, the last 10 years that we've been around. And so I won't, um, we are gonna brush through a lot of things and I'm probably gonna talk a little too fast. So any questions, again, please throw them in the chat or just kind of yell it out. Um, but we are gonna brush on a lot of things kind of quickly. So um, if there's anything that you need me to repeat, please don't hesitate to ask. So we'll start with lead exposure. Um, the thing about lead is that it's a neurotoxin, can be harmful to humans. A lot of us have probably heard of it in some capacity. Most people know of it primarily through water, um, but actually the, the primary route for exposure can typically be through paint and dust. And that's because prior to 1978, lead was widely used in, um, in paint. It's a really durable product. It helps um, paint stay um, much longer than some now we have you know, better technology, but back then prior in like the 1950s, um, it really was a durable product, but now we know a lot about um, you know, the harm that it can cause, especially for a developing um, child. And so we do uh, highlight lead here because over 80% of the homes in Allegheny County and over 86% of the homes in the state of PA were built before 1978. And 1978 is this magic number because basically that's when lead was banned from residential paint. A lot of us probably know that when you buy a home, they, you know, they, there's some kind of discussion about lead. And when you rent, there's some kind of disclosure that a landlord has to say, basically, they don't know what the lead is, but that there could be risk. And so this is something we do want to highlight because it is such a prominent issue, especially regionally um, in the Western PA area. And so we're highlighting that, especially for anybody with, um, with children or if you're living in a 1978 home, pre-1978 home, um, or if you're expecting or anything along those lines, really just make sure that, um, that we're keeping this at the forefront. So the primary routes, paint and dust, like I mentioned, it's really chipping and peeling paint. So if you look around, like I can see in my window, so right now there's some cracking and chipping and peeling paint um, in high friction areas, like windows, doors, um, that kind of stuff, water, like I mentioned as well, and soil. And so I don't wanna to dive too, too deep into those, but if you have any questions about the different um, routes of, or uh, ways that we find lead, um, feel free to follow up with me. But like I mentioned, it's primarily um, important for exposure to young children, but it can have um, impacts on adults as well. Adults are typically exposed to like a workplace. And so if you're 
working either in like an old smelter or if you're doing some kind of work and renovation in older buildings. Um, those are kind of the more primary routes for adults, whereas children, it's mainly crawling, head to mouth, exploring, um, things like that. And so there are, you know, a lot of things that we can do in our home. Um, we're pretty like shine the light on resource type of group here. We want to make sure we're doing all we can to make sure that people know about the resources. And so when it comes to water, the biggest thing is to filter if you can, test if you can, and if you can't do either of those, um, make sure you're always using your cold tap water, um, especially if you're preparing any kind of baby formula or even when cooking, um, it's a good rule of thumb to always use your cold tap water, um, not just for lead, but also because sometimes water can sit in a hot water tank for a while um, and things can settle at the bottom uh, and, uh, um, and as water is heated, certain uh, heavy metals have higher uh, boiling points and you can kind of see those heightened in some hot water tanks. And so good rule of thumb, use your cold, um, cold water uh, when cooking and preparing any kind of food or formula. Um, but when it comes to filters, we'll kind of get this, um, go to the next slide of what touches on all of these, but I don't know if you can read this super well. So I, if you can, I can try to zoom, but if not, I'll just kind of read through that. But when it comes to water, um, and I know I talked to Jen about this actually when we were uh, discussing uh, this, um, this session, is you're gonna look for, and the second one there, it's number two, NSF. So the three letters, NSF, certified water filter. So that's your, that's a good rule of thumb um, for any kind of uh, water filter that you're looking for, whether that be some one for your faucet or one that you would just put in your fridge. Um, that means that it's certified and verified to remove lead and other heavy metals like cadmium, mercury, anything like that. Um, it's been certified by a third party that it does. Um, it is uh, efficient at removing those. And so if you're in the market for a water filter, um, look for that NSF certified um, Label, um, Zero Water is a good brand that we've been um, using for a few years now. And if you need help getting access to a water filter, we can always help you. Um, so that's kind of the big one on water, but I will go back. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, especially if you are cooking or doing anything like that for um, preparing food, using the cold water tap. But the big thing in Western PA, like I mentioned, really is the dust and the paint. And so if you are in a home and you don't have, you know, you know, painting is done in your budget this year, that's okay. Your home can have lead in it, but it could be lead safe. And so really the key to that is minimizing uh, dust and really making sure that you're wet dusting and wet mopping. Um, taking just like any kind of regular duster is just gonna move the dust from one place to another. So a good rule of thumb in any kind of cleaning is to really always wet dust and wet mop. Um, so make sure you guys get your backpacks ready. Um, especially if uh, <laughs> you're, um, uh, especially if you have like microfiber cloth or any kind of wet damp, uh, wet damp um, uh, cloth or uh, mop will be really helpful. Um, so that's the big one there. And so I won't read through all of these, but those are the big things in your home is really making sure you're minimizing dust where you can, maintaining paint when and if you can. And if you rent, make sure you are bringing this to your landlord landlord's attention, especially if you live in a home before 1978. So we, again, I can share all these infographics. Um, and if you have any questions specific to lead, let me know, but I do want to breeze through these. So um, radon, that's another hey, thing. Anna, I, I don't mean yeah. to interrupt, but nope. I, if there was a question, are pets, oh, sorry. At, are pets at risk for lead exposure and what sort of symptoms would you see? Yeah, that's actually a question that I got a few weeks ago, actually. And that was kind of the first time that I'd um, kind of heard of that. Yes, um, you know, any, anybody that's ingesting anything uh, can be at risk for lead exposure. Um, there have been a few studies of lead exposure in dogs. Um, and so the thing about animals is for it to be, you know, where you would see symptoms, it would be really, really high. Um, and that's kind of even in um, uh, humans too. Uh, the symptoms that you see of like immediate exposure um, are they'd have to be really high. The more long-term impacts are from lead are actually like behavioral. So you would see it kind of more long-term in terms of like, um, especially in, in children, you would see it kind of mimicking things like um, attention deficit disorder and things with behavior and um, stuff along the, on those lines where it would, you would see kind of an immediate response would be if it was a really, really high level and um, the dog would, or your pet would almost be acting uh, kind of like loopy or delirious or things like that, it would be really, really high. Um, but if it's something that you're concerned about, you know, if, you're, if your dog is, a, you know, like select the floor or specific spots of the house that you've seen, you know, have chipping or peeling paint, um, you can always bring that up to a vet. Um, it's an easy blood draw, uh, typical, you know, with most people, it's 
done in like a well visit with a physical. Um, and I'm sure for a pet, it's probably a very similar blood draw. Um, but for you to see any symptoms, it would have to be like really, really high. The minimal levels, you probably wouldn't really see a whole lot, but it can um, be linked to some chronic diseases that are linked to like some kidney um, issues as well as some um, other more chronic diseases. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, a space that probably doesn't have the most research, but it's definitely something that you could definitely see. So if you are concerned, make sure you bring that up to a vet if that's something that you know, you're like, oh, they're acting a little funky. Maybe I should check that out. All right. Um, and we have so many resources on lead. I could do a whole hour just on lead if we really wanted to. Um, so please, seriously, feel free to reach out, especially if you have young kids under the age of six. Make sure you're getting them tested. Um, they are required to get tested at age um, one and two now in Allegheny County, and you have to kind of show proof of that similar like you would to a vaccine. Um, so make sure you're getting them tested. There's a lot of resources available for families, which I'll touch on those in the end. I have a whole resource section of this PowerPoint, but um, please, please reach out. Uh, we have a whole Get the Let Out campaign right now, um, especially for City of Pittsburgh residents. And we do have some uh, resources for risk assessments in your home as well. So we will touch lightly on radon. And I'm sure anybody who's bought a house in the last four years knows a little bit about radon. Um, and so it's basically... Um, a naturally occurring gas that forms kind of underneath um, the Earth's layer. And so when things are moving and um, different you know, parts of the world are kind of uh, moving and rotating, some of that gas can leak up through the ground. And so what that looks like in Western PA is we have hills and valleys and we have seasons. And a lot of us have basements that are old um, and probably have some cracks in the foundation. And so radon is something that can kind of um, come up, especially in basements. Um, there's nothing really that any of us have done to make that happen. It's totally part of the, the geography of the earth. Um, we just happen to live in Western PA where we have higher levels of it. And so um, where that kind of comes into play is that you are required to uh, do a radon test um, at a point of sale. Well, I, I kind of found out the way that the market is, it's so hot right now that you could actually opt out of that if you wanted to, which is kind of crazy. I didn't know you could do that. Um, but now, so anybody... Uh, who, when you sell a house, you basically have to get a test for radon. And so why is that important? Well, radon is actually the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers. So it's, um, it, it can really have some harmful impacts on our health and it's totally invisible, odorless, smell, like it, you, you wouldn't even know it was there unless you're testing. And so we really do want to make sure that people are thinking about um, testing their homes annually. Um, every January, a uh, good rule of thumb is to test your home for radon. You really wanna do it in the winter months. That's when you get a really good picture of the air in your home, especially in your basement. Um, in the summer, when we have windows open and doors open, it can kind of warp um, the uh, actual reading level of when all your windows and things are shut. Um, so what uh, a good rule of thumb is as well is anything over four would require um, a radon reduction system. So four picoliters, it's a science term, but you don't need to know what that means, but anything over four, you'd want to start um, getting connected to some uh, mitigation resources. And um, that all exists through the PA, DEP, Department of Health. Again, we have resources for that on our website as well. Um, but that can go anywhere um, from 150, depending on the home, to $200, sometimes upwards of like four, depending on the size of the home and what your levels are. Um, testing is really cost efficient. You can get it at Home Depot. Um, most tests are like 15 bucks. We actually, in Allegheny County, because we um, have higher levels, you can request a free radon test through the American Lung Association. I actually just got mine. I'm gonna do my test to, um, probably this week. Um, and so you can, there, there's a lot of resources for those as well. Again, that's on our website. I'll make sure we have these links here. Um, but the really good rule of thumb, test annually. That way you get a good, accurate picture. If it comes back with the four, let's make sure we get you connected to someone who can help you get a uh, reduction system. And that's literally just creating kind of an air filter from the outside to your inside that pulls that air, filters it, and releases it back out. All right, any questions on radon? Most of us probably know. We've probably heard of it at some point. Um, so next thing, especially in, um, you know, this fine uh, rainy day that we've had today, I think a lot of us uh, understand um, how important mold can be in a home, especially where moisture is trapped. Um, most of us know what mold is. I'm not going to make you read this slide, but basically it can be really stubborn. It's fungi and it's spores that can uh, really thrive in dark, damp conditions, that being primarily bathrooms, basements, things where moisture is trapped. And so it can be really hard to get rid of. 
Um, and I think a lot of people's good rule of thumb is to just dump bleach on it and hope it goes away. And while that can be a primary fix, you're not really physically removing the spores. That's where um, you do see more long-term um, removal practices is when you're physically, you know, putting some elbow grease in it with a detergent and um, some kind of soap to try to actually remove the spore, whereas just killing it can kind of keep it on the surface and give it a chance to regrow. And so mold is tricky. And a lot of the things that you know are listed here are a lot of the things that we can try to do, but sometimes don't always have the capacity to do. So really trying to maintain humidity, 50% uh, humidity in your home is a good rule of thumb. Um, if you don't have a dehumidifier in your basement and you live in Western PA, let's try to get you one because uh, it's probably, especially in an older home, um, is really important uh, to try to control the humidity, especially in a basement. Um, ventilation, I know, especially in, if you rent in an older Pittsburgh bathroom, a lot of places don't have the, the, the fan vent in a bathroom, which is crazy. Um, and if you don't and you have a window, even just cracking a window just a little bit during a shower can help limit um, moisture in a home. Uh, carpeting, really popular in the 80s to put carpeting in bathrooms. And I think a lot of us learned a really valuable lesson. Um, and so if you do have carpeting there, um, if you can't get rid of it, just trying to vacuum up as much as you can, as often as you can is, is really good. And if you can remove it, try to do that. Um, and a really big thing, especially, um, you know, not in basements or in bathrooms, but also in like attics is leaks. That's where you can see a lot of um, mold as well. And so, you know, doing whatever we can to fix leaks. And like I said, cleaning. Now, the thing about bleach is it can be really helpful to kill the to kill the mold, but you have to use it properly. And I think a lot of people learned this with COVID now too, is that, you know, like I said, most people's rule of thumb is to just take the jug and dump it on there and hope it works. Well, that actually won't really do a whole lot. If bleach isn't diluted properly, it does not work the way that it's designed to work. And so you, to, in order to, you, to do it well, you have to dilute it properly. And that's one cup of bleach to one gallon of water. And now I will say, I actually, I, I rent and we were having some issues in our in our bathtub. I found that peroxide has been a kind of an easier alternative and it's much, much less harsh. So I'm gonna add that to the slide after this because I didn't realize that it wasn't on there because hydrogen peroxide, you can literally just squirt it right on, let it sit um, and then let it let it bubble up a little bit and then take you know elbow grease, a, rat, a rug and some soap and it will really help lift it off. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of DIY recipes. You could Google it, you could ask me, um, but don't just dump, bleach on it because that really won't do a whole lot. If you're going to use bleach, make sure you're using it um, diluted. All right, moving on. Um, a thing that, you know, a lot of us definitely deal with, but a lot of people don't want to talk about is pests. So that can include, you know, things like mice and cockroaches and spiders and all those things that are in our homes that freak us out that nobody wants to talk about. Um, but a lot of our default on how we deal with that is to get bait and to get chemical traps and to get things like that that we think will do the job to kill them, which it will. They, they you know, they're insecticides, they're pesticides, they will kill. But they can also harm other things too. They're, they're meant to kill, but not just pests. Um, and so there are much safer, efficient, and effective ways to, you know, deal with pests in our home. A lot of that starts with, you know, clutter and cleaning in those spaces that we kind of forget about sometimes, especially in cupboards, especially in closets and pantries, um, crumbs, places where crumbs, you know, kind of hide and you never think about them ever again is behind your refrigerator. Uh, when I moved, I was like, oh my God, I need to clean that more. Um, so definitely, you know, there's places where you don't, we don't think about it every day. And so our default is, oh, I need to get something to kill it. Um, but what, hap what can happen is, especially with bait, um, it can always, it can actually attract um, more pests than what you had before. Um, so really bait is kind of a last stitch. If nothing else ever worked again, we would go for it. But there are a lot of good ways to, to deal with it before doing that. Um, and like I said, cleaning up in the spaces that we don't always think about. Um, the other one is sealing cracks and openings. And I never realized this until um, I started looking more at basements. And if you see, you know, cracks or even just random holes from like a living room to a basement, um, filling those. And if you don't really have the proper tools or don't really know exactly what to do, a good um, easy thing that I found um, is uh, almost, what, what's it called? Like chicken wire, but not chicken wire. It's like an SOS pad and I'm blanking on the name of what like that material is. Uh, steel wool? Yes, yeah, steel wool. I was like, oh my God, I'm like blanking. Um, but yeah, so um, most pests can't eat their way through that. 
Um, so if you have a random hole and you're like, I have no idea what to put here and you don't have caulking or don't have something that you could put in there, steel wool is really easy. You can get it at the Dollar Tree um, and you can stick it in a hole and that will help seal off a hole from a pest kind of coming in. As well as um, any kind of cardboard um, glue trap. Um, any glue trap that doesn't have any bait or anything in it, it's literally just a piece of cardboard with a little strip of glue on the bottom. Um, put those kind of by uh, areas, especially in the summer, where you're kind of in and out of um, areas that are more problematic. Uh, they're really good. You stick them right there. You'll be amazed at what kind of sticks on them. Um, they're called roach motels. We typically give them out um, in uh, some of our cleaning kits that we do. Um, oh, sorry. Here we go. Oh, very cool, radon monitor in the basement. That's really cool. Uh, getting live readings, that, that's probably why it was $100. <laughs> Most of them are cheaper because you get a one-time reading. But, um, but yeah, so really using more holistic ways of getting rid of bugs rather than just kind of spraying things with pesticides and insecticides. Um, I won't go through all of those here, but we do have some really good resources. And Penn State, um, they have a whole IPM uh, program um, and they can really help you, especially if you have very specific issues uh, in your home that you really don't know how to deal with, we can make sure we get you connected to them. But there are a lot of other really easy, less toxic ways to deal with pests than just using pesticides and insecticides. Um, okay, and this is where we'll spend a little bit more time, but out of, again, I'm gonna try to breeze through these as much as I can, but I will say I'll plug, I think the end of April, I am gonna be working with Wendy's group as well. We'll spend a little bit more time on the green cleaning and disinfecting kind of part of this presentation. So I will kind of breeze through the breeze through this, but please ask any questions. And so, um, you know, this whole speak, this whole second part of this uh, conversation is really around cleaning personal care products and how does that impact, you know, our health, the air quality in our home and, uh, and things like that. And so all of these things, radon, mold, all of this kind of is an, is an indoor air quality issue. Things that we're breathing in, toxic fumes, dust, paint, mold, cleaning supplies, all of those things that we don't think about, that we use every day, that really do have a cumulative impact. Um, and poor indoor air quality for anybody who has asthma, um, you can definitely probably have an example on hand of where someone used Febreze or someone sprayed um, a, a perfume or even just used bleach and you walked in and you couldn't catch your breath for a few seconds. And so uh, these are why we kind of make sure that we're including this in here um, because it is so prominent, especially for anybody with a respiratory heart disease um, as well. And so really this slide is kind of crazy and it's kind of scary and it really just shows that United States is really behind. And so there are like over 80,000 and this number is probably growing now. I think these numbers were from like 2019. So I we don't even have the most updated, but there's over 80,000 chemicals that can be on the market that can be found in our homes. Only 200 of those have been uh, tested uh, by the FDA. Um, and only of those 200 have 11 been banned. So we know that the testing to banning to use rate is very wildly not on par for where it should be. And so why we kind of highlight, that, highlight this is not to scare people, but to just say that we have a market that is not really friendly. It's not really consumer friendly. It's very much we're going to put stuff out, see how it goes, and kind of go from there. And so what we want to help you do is kind of how to be able to be a smart shopper until the policies catch up to where they need to be. Because right now, they're not there. And so right now, unfortunately, the onus is on us as a consumer and a purchaser. Um, but I will say, in the last three years, we've seen kind of a shift. You can see, even on Walmart shelves, you can see clean and paraben-free and phthalate-free and things like that. Um, so the market really is changing, um, but it is something that has been from a consumer demand. Um, and so things that, you know, we think about, especially in personal care products here, are things like phthalates, parabens, um, some stuff is, uh, in formaldehyde as well. Um, all of these different things, I won't go through them, um, but these are different ingredients that were used in um, a lot of our products because they worked, they kept the shelf life long, but now we know a little bit more about them. And uh, things like phthalates and parabens look like um, they're called endocrine disruptors. So basically they look like our naturally occurring endocrines, but kind of trick our body into thinking that something's happening that it's not, and it can cause some, some health issues. Um, a lot of those being early puberty, um, that being kind of a, a, a primary one um, more frequently. And that bottom one there is fragrance. Fragrance is great. Everybody likes to smell good. Everything's, everybody likes when things smell good, especially in your home. Um, but what is a little bit crazy, and I didn't know this until I started my job, is that 
um, fragrance is kind of a trade secret. So if a business found a scent that they really like, they don't want someone to take it, so they don't have to tell you what's in it. And so what's crazy is that in one fragrance can be a combination of up to 2000 chemicals to make that one scent. And they don't have to tell you what it is because it's a trade secret. Um, and so really thinking about um, fragrances is really important and are in our personal care products. And then this is kind of more specific to cleaning products, but um, yes. And so we can get to, I'll uh, touch on candles in the home in like one second, but actually no, I'll do it right now because you asked. Um, yes, candles are uh, really important and things like any kind of air freshener. So an aerosol sprayer, a candle, um, even sometimes even the candle warmers that we use um, can be sometimes problematic for our indoor air quality. And um, for a few ways, uh, that's through fragrance, like I mentioned, and through something called volatile organic compounds, which is a really fancy word to just say things that you're using in your air that are kind of bad. Um, and that includes fragrance, but that can include a couple other things, especially in cleaning products, um, especially in bleach and chlorine. And so what we think about more in candles is actually the fragrance and the burning of the fragrance and the synthetic wicks. And so if you are, you know, I love, I love a good candle. I love a good smell. Um, there are good kind of rules of thumb when you are purchasing. And so soy or beeswax candles are a good alternative to like a synthetically made candle, um, which is no, huh, this was a hard reality when I started this job too, which uh, Yankee candles and Bath and Body Works, um, unless they say like soy or or beeswax. Um, most of them aren't. Most of them are synthetic candles. So, um, and also is the wick. Most wicks are actually like basically um, some kind of synthetic plastic that when you're burning in your home is really just burning plastic. And so a good rule of thumb for a wick is looking either for like, um, like a, a wood wick or a cotton wick or things like that um, as well. And so really, really, you know, candles can kind of be a little tricky. Um, so really reading the label for a candle is really important. Um, but those are some things that you'd want to look at. And if they're fragranced with, you know, um, something that's like a natural oil or, uh, you know, along those lines, uh, essential oils can be a little tricky too, because um, there's no real regulation around um, essential oils. And so they can say that they're organic and made well, uh, but there's no real verification that they are. Uh, so it's really important to just read the labels. Um, so I know that that's kind of a long-winded answer to say that yes, Candles are important to think about. And yes, we want to make sure that we're trying to minimize um, or really think about the ones we use in our homes. Um, and there are some good resources, like I'll, I'll mention at the end, um, through the Environmental Working Group that really do provide some good resources and insights on when you are purchasing things like that in your home. Um, but yeah, they can definitely be uh, something we want to think about in helping improve our indoor air quality. Um, and so here are things that are more specific to cleaning. And so that's ammonia, bleach, chlorine, any quat based cleaner, which is primarily what was on the market, um, you know, prior to COVID and now. And so uh, this is, again, something that I mentioned, we'll, we'll definitely dive deeper into with Wendy, but um, things that we do want to avoid in our home. And I know that is a very hard thing um, for some for some folks. And I know that in a lot of ways, some of these products are going to have to be used in small doses and moderation and properly. Um, but these are ones that, you know, we have been some studies. A lot of them have been linked to being um, irritants, respiratory irritants, um, and things that we know that can be pretty unsafe. And so I'm flagging them here, knowing that we can spend a little bit more um, time uh, later in the next session, kind of going through what good alternatives exist. But I will highlight that um, especially now with COVID, um, uh, hydrogen peroxide alternative or uh, peroxide based cleaners and alcohol um, based cleaners are good alternatives to using bleach and chlorine and quat based um, cleaners. Uh, they're really effective, um, really great, and a little bit safer. Uh, they don't um, uh, cause such spikes in our indoor air quality in terms of VOCs, um, and so can be a little bit safer uh, alternatives to bleach and chlorine based products. And so most primary or uh, most big box retailers now do have um, bleach and, or uh, peroxide and alcohol based products. Lysol does, um, uh, what's the other big one that I'm blanking on right now? Purell, uh, they have one now as well too that we actually recommend in a lot of our school settings as well. So they're all, there are good ready, uh, ready to use alternatives to bleach and chlorine. Um, Basically, this is a long-winded slide to just say that the U.S. is behind, and like I mentioned, we don't have a very consumer-friendly market right now, um, whereas other countries 
um, and other nations are a little bit more ahead of us and kind of have a little bit more science in front of them and a little bit more regulations that we are hoping we can get to um, in the US. And so basically this is kind of all just to say that um, fragrance, like I said, is vague. It can be a combination of a lot of things. They don't really have to tell you what's in it. There are loopholes in some disclosures of ingredients. Um, greenwashing is really a thing. Um, the only thing that is really certified organic in the United States is meat. Everything else that really says that it's organic or is or meat and some foods, but um, and fruits and vegetables, but any product or any um, uh, like shampoo or soap that you're using that says it's organic and clean and safe and free is just a label. There's no real certification behind or regulation behind putting that on a label. And so it really is important where the ingredient list can come in. And so greenwashing was a term, especially I think in you know the, the mid 2000s when putting a label on that said like green and eco-friendly and really was, you know, blurring people in. And then it kind of, you flip the bottle and you look at the ingredients, and you're like, hmm, this isn't that at all. And so um, it really is important. And like I mentioned earlier, we have gone much, made very big strides in the last few years. And so looking at ingredients now, um, you know, there are still some brands that do greenwash and they do kind of paint a picture that their product is something that it's not, but there are a lot of better products now. There, um, there really are companies that are really committing to this. And so can still be a little wonky and still can be a little frustrating, but we're in a much better place than we were a few years ago. <clears throat> Sorry. So now I do wanna spend a little bit of time just to go through some of the resources that exist. And so, like I mentioned, uh, when it comes to personal care products, it really is important to, if you can, avoid fragrances, especially in skin products. Um, they can be really irritating uh, anyways. And so any kind of skin or body product, if you can avoid fragrance, really try to. Labels, super important. If you can flip the bottle, um, and I'll show, I'll give you a resource, because um, nobody should have to be a chemistry major to know what's in their products, which is the way that it exists right now. But there are some tools that we um, can we can share that can make that process a little bit easier. Um, you know, kind of going back to some DIY recipes, uh, looking at, you know, what maybe our grandparents' grandparents did for their dish soap or what they did for their bathroom cleaner. Um, we have some really good DIY recipes for things like window cleaners and soap scrubs and things like that as well. And like uh, I'll kind of put at the end, there is a database for the Environmental Working Group um, they have a lot of really good resources when it comes to like being in a store and being able to scan a product um, and rating it and helping you make that purchasing decision. So that's what's here. This is called the Skin Deep product, but they also have a slew of other really good Healthy Homes products here. Um, and so it's an app. You can find this in an app store uh, and it's really helpful. Um, and if you need any more uh, you know, resources on that or need any help getting that, please feel free to let me know. Um, there aren't always every product that is in the store on this app yet. Um, and so uh, sometimes you might not be able to find the product that you're looking for, but it will be able to at least help you kind of walk through that as well as here, um, we has a top 12 toxins to avoid. And so this is when you're purchasing um, any kind of personal care or cosmetic product here. So if you see any of those 12 things on a back of a bottle, try to find a different one. Um, and so we have this in a print version, but we also have it in um, an electronic version. You can just take a screenshot of it, keep it on your phone. When you're going to buy your next bottle of shampoo or your next bottle of body wash, pull this up. If you see anything that looks like that, um, you know, maybe look for a different product. Um, and like I said, some DIY stuff, uh, baking soda and vinegar, you know, baking soda has been used forever in a lot of different capacities, but in cleaning more specifically, especially in bathrooms. Vinegar, I think most people who have uh, uh, original hardwood floors know that vinegar is a really great product for um, cleaning floors and for any kind of all-purpose cleaner. Um, and so really kind of going back to some of the, the basic products that you could probably find in your pantry right now. Um, and um, these are kind of more housing specific and healthy home specific resources. Again, I won't read through all of these because I know we're kind of getting close on time, but some of these are more specific to housing remediation for lead, like I mentioned, some of it's specific to water. Um, so we have all of this on our website and on the Get the Lead Out website, um, but there are there are resources. If you are in, a, in an issue and you're thinking in your house and you're like, oh, I really need to get something for this or I really need to buy a product for this, there's a resource and I wanna help you find it. So um, I won't read through all of those because I wanna make sure we have time for any questions that I didn't get to, but that's my contact information. Um, 
this is a lot of information. So if you go, you know, you go through the night and you're like, oh, I should have asked this, please feel free to reach out. Please feel free to check out our website. We have a lot of good stuff. We just launched our new website with a lot of really good information and good resources. So um, that's kind of my spiel. And I know I talked fast. So please, uh, please feel free if you have any questions that um, I didn't get to. And I think there's one here that I didn't answer yet. So let me look. Do you recommend the app detox me? Um, yeah, we haven't really worked with it too, too much, but it can be really helpful. Um, I know when we've worked primarily with the with the EWG app, um, but any kind of app like that, that has a standard for, you know, a purchase for purchasing a product or has gone through some kind of checklist before they verified a product can be, can be helpful. So yeah, um, anything like that. I, I should actually do a little bit more digging into detox and make sure, um, that like they kind of meet the same standards, but I know that we've used it before um, and it can be a really good resource. Well, that was fantastic, Hannah. And you did go fast and you had, you had a lot of great uh, subjects. I mean, and, and you know, things that we probably already know, but it, but we I just don't do, you know, like for yeah. instance, I mean, I had no idea you're supposed to test for radon every year. Yeah. We tested, you know, when we purchased the home and I figured we test when we, sell the home but uh I, and i love rachel that you have a device that's constantly monitoring because i didn't realize that was available either um, you know because that is an issue either um until i did you know saw the best practices for it and it's really just because you know like the way we are in western pa our, our ground moves you know you see that in our roads we have cracks in our roads you're gonna have cracks in your basement you're gonna have cracks in your um, in your foundation, and that's normal, but that can totally change, you know, what's underneath, and that can change the way it gets up, and so um, testing annually is a really good, really good best practice, and like I mentioned, we can 